Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip M. Iguali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, U.E. St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind address the theme, Crossing New Frontiers to Conquer Today's Challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be there on Sunday, June 8th, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, U.E. St. Augustine. Parallel supercomputing is an entirely new approach to modern computer science. Yet, there is a limit to the theoretically unlimited speed of the parallel supercomputer. Looking back, in 1946, the fastest computer in the world used only one scalar processing unit. In 1988, the fastest computer in the world still computed with only one vector processing unit. Shortly after the U.S. Independence Day of 1989, the media reported that an African supercomputer wizard in the United States of America had discovered how the most massively parallel supercomputer ever built can massively compute with 65,536 commodity processors and solve 65,536 computational physics problems and solve them simultaneously. Nine in 10 supercomputer cycles are executed while solving extreme scale systems of equations of algebra and physics. I had figured out how to finesse my 64 binary thousand processors, enabling them to communicate and to communicate and collaborate to reduce the time to solution of extreme scale systems of equations of algebra and to reduce that time to solution from 65,536 days or 108 years on one isolated processor to just one day across an ensemble of 65,536 processors. That new knowledge enabled those processors to compute quickly and accurately and to make the impossible to solve systems of equations of extreme scale algebra possible to solve. I introduced how to use that new knowledge in algebra and thus build digital replicas of petroleum reservoirs and the Earth's climate. I want to be remembered as the first person to witness the transition from the computer that did one thing at a time to the supercomputer that did many things at once. I believe that our children's children will coin a new word for their supercomputers. They will invent supercomputers that are science fiction to us. I discovered a new way of thinking about the new fastest supercomputer and about the supercomputer of tomorrow, not as a computer per se, but as a global network of tightly coupled processors that is an internet. My discovery was processor agnostic and was a blueprint for a never before seen internet. The invention of a faster supercomputer is a milestone of human progress. That invention made some impossible to solve problems arising in physics, algebra, and calculus 
possible to solve. I'm Philip Emmanuel. I remember the day I first programmed a supercomputer. It was June 20, 1974. I remember that date in part because I was on the cover of a local newspaper that was published three weeks later and because then U.S. President Richard Nixon was forced to resign 18 days later. Back in mid July 1974, the half dozen Nigerians in Polk County of Oregon were proud to see my photo on the cover of their local newspaper. That newspaper was on the newsstands of the Oregonian cities of Mormont and Independence. The Nigerians that read that article came to congratulate me. Nigerians crowded into my tiny one-room studio apartment that was at 195A South North Street, Mormont, Oregon. That evening, we talked about the recent resignation of then U.S. President Richard Nixon. That evening, we went to see a performance in Mormont, Oregon, that was delivered by the mentalist called the Amazing Kreskin. I remember the day my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing was highlighted by the Wall Street Journal. I remember it as June 20, 1990. Not because I was in the Wall Street Journal per se, but because I started programming conventional supercomputers exactly 16 years er earlier on June 20, 1974 and at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon, United States. I remember by association, not memorization. And for that reason, friends say that I have a photographic memory an elephant memory, called an eidetic memory. I was asked, how did Philip Emmanuel become a father of the internet? When I began supercomputing back on June 20, 1974, in Cobalis, Oregon, United States, I did not embark on a quest to become a father of the internet. But if the father of the airplane is the pe person that invented the first airplane, then the father of the internet should be the person that invented the first internet. I am the only father of the internet that invented a new internet. And I am known as the first person to program a new internet that I visualized as a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors that I also visualized as being equal distances apart from each other. Those 65,536 processors had separate memories from each other with each processor operating its own operating system. It made the news headlines in 1989 that I discovered that new internet to be a virtual supercomputer. My physical experiments across my ensemble of tightly coupled commodity of the shelf processors gave me the street cred that is akin to that of the prophet that became a political prisoner or that of the poet whose wife committed suicide. I'm Philip Emmanuel. Students writing school reports on great inventors often ask, what is Philip Emmanuel known for? In abstract geometrical terms, I'm known for defining and delineating this technology called parallel processing and for precisely describing it as the vital technology that enables supercomputing across the surface of a globe. That globe is embedded within a 16-dimensional hyperspace 
and I'm known for discovering that supercomputer as a never before before seen internet that is a new global network of two raised to power 16 or 65,536 tightly coupled processors that were identical to each other, that shared nothing between each other, with each processor operating its own operating system. Back in 1989, I was in the news for discovering Practical parallel processing, the technology that enables the modern supercomputer to solve many real world problems at once instead of solving only one problem at a time. Massively parallel processing enabled me to solve one grand challenge problem of mathematical physics that is an ensemble of 65,000. 536 challenging problems of computational physics and solve them synchronously. Loosely speaking and in theory, the computer that is powered by only one processor can solve a grand challenge problem that the parallel supercomputer that is powered by one billion processors can solve. However, the computer takes 1 billion days or nearly 3 million years to solve a grand, challenge, a grand challenge problem that the parallel supercomputer takes only one day to solve. However, it took me 16 years on word of March 25, 1974 to understand the physics calculus and algebra and arithmetic or to understand the human process of solving that grand challenge problem. I had to understand that process before I can instruct my ensemble of 64 binary thousand processors on how to massively parallel process the grand challenge problem that I divided in, into as, into as 65,000 536 smaller problems. I was in the news because I discovered practical parallel supercomputing or how to solve many problems at once or in parallel and how to simultaneously solve 65,536 problems across 65,536 tightly coupled processors and solve them at the same time. What is Philip? What is the Philip Emma Aguale internet? Even after I had won the top prize in supercomputing and won it after 16 years of supercomputing, it took another 16 years for many supercomputer scientists to understand that I had parallel processed across a new internet and that I invented a new internet that was a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors. That 16 year delay or adjustment period was due to the fact that parallel processing across a new internet was very difficult to understand. Parallel processing empowered me to invent a virtual supercomputer that is a new internet that retains the illusion of being a computer per se. On the blackboard, my new internet exists almost to the point of complete abstraction. My new internet is the invincible and the marginal technology that haunts the transitory zones where the boundaries between mathematical physics and computational physics and between computing and supercomputing are blurred. My definition of an internet is a metaphor that destabilizes the textbook meaning of the word 
computer that in turn was first used in print 2,000 years ago and first used by the Roman author Pliny the Elder. I was asked, why is Philip Emma Aguale called a father of the internet? I am called a father of the internet because I am the only father of the internet that invented a new internet. Inventing a parallel supercomputer that costs more than the annual budget of each of the 40 poorest nations in the world is tougher than writing a book of poetry. And tougher in part because to invent is to make the impossible possible. That's why 50,000 fiction books are published each year in the United States alone. That's why 300,000 books are published each year in the United States alone, with the average book selling less than 250 copies. In contrast, it took half a century to invent a new supercomputer and to progress from the July supercomputer of 1939 that in theory could solve a system of 29 equations of algebra. It took 50 years to progress to the parallel supercomputer of 1989 that made the news headlines when I used it to solve 24 million equations of large scale algebra that was then a world record. For this reason, inventing a new supercomputer is rarer than writing a best selling book. The number of self-published books is over 1 million a year. You cannot read the same book 10 times. However, 10,000 programmers can program the same supercomputer and do so at once. If you are a writer, you can write 1,000 words every day. If you are a mountain climber, you cannot become the first person to climb Mount Everest, the highest mountain, and climb it every day. You cannot break that historical record every day. If you are an inventor, you cannot invent a new internet every day. The reason it is easier to write than to invent is that the writer creates her literature Hence the term creative writer. But it is impossible to have a quote unquote creative discoverer. You can write one page a day and complete a novel in one year. But you cannot write one page a day and invent a new supercomputer or invent a new internet and do so every year. Writing is infinite, but inventing is finite. Great scientific discoverers are rare simply because groundbreaking discoveries that are prerequisites to becoming a great discoverer are also rare. Great scientific discoverers are rare because they can only discover a thing that pre-exists and the discoverer's genius has nothing to do with the pre-existence of high discovery. Great inventors are rare because the inventor can only invent what's possible to be invented. Great inventors are rare because they cannot invent a law of physics or invent a perpetual motion machine. 2,000 years, 2000, 2,000 years ago, the Roman author Pliny the Elder became the first person to use the word computer. For two millennia, the name computer remained the same. However, the basic premise that defined the fastest computer 
has changed. It changed from the supercomputer that computed only one thing at a time or a sequence to the supercomputer that solved millions of problems across millions of processors and at once or in parallel and in a one problem to one processor corresponded manner. The supercomputer continuously redefined itself just as this generation of supercomputer scientists redefined itself. For simplicity and uniformity and to avoid being a prisoner of details, I use the word computer to describe computing machineries that my generation also called CPUs or processors, nodes or cores, parallel computers or quantum computers, microcomputers or supercomputers, and so on. What does a supercomputer look like? A supercomputer needs email wires that total 200 miles of cables. A supercomputer can consume 5,000 gallons of water per minute and do so to stay cool. A supercomputer can consume as much electricity as 10,000 volts. A supercomputer can weigh as much as a commercial airplane. Parallel processing is the vital technology that powers the world's most powerful supercomputers. The use of parallel processing to solve the toughest problems is limited to the imagination of supercomputer scientists of tomorrow. What is parallel processing? Imagine that 200 million Nigerians were invited to queue in only one line and to vote at the rate of one voter per minute. This process will take 200 million minutes or 380 years, allowing only one person to vote at a time and only at one polling station. It's akin to solving only one problem at a time and only at one processor. This sequential processing technology was the basic knowledge behind the old one processor technology that powered the old supercomputers, including the conventional supercomputers of the 1940s, through the vector supercomputers of the 1980s. On the 4th of July, 1989, I discovered practical parallel processing, and I discovered it as the vital technology that now underpins every supercomputer and hopefully will underpin every computer. The incorporation of parallel processing technology into every supercomputer is the reason the supercomputer that was formerly the size of the refrigerator now occupies the space of a soccer field. I believe that a word that has been used for 2,000 years is likely to be used for another 2,000 years. The word computer was in human vocabulary for 2,000 years. The word computer would remain in our descendants vocabulary for another 2,000 years. But the computer of 2,000 years from today is expected to be vastly different from the computer of today. I believe that by the end of the 21st century, that our children's children will develop a new internet technology that will encapsulate the internet that I invented as processors that encircled a globe and did so in the manner the internet encircles planet Earth. That new internet will be a new supercomputer that will be a subset of the entire planetary sized internet. The computer has always been and could always be 
a machinery that is used to perform the fastest computations and that solves the most computation-intensive problems and solve them automatically and sometimes in parallel. By definition and by necessity, the supercomputer of the future will be the planetary-sized computer that performs the fastest computations. I believe that in a century, the internet will become the network of humans that will be directly wired into the internet and that automatically sends and receives the fastest telepathic email communications as opposed to a network of only processors and computers that it is today. Parallel processing is the crown jewel inside every supercomputer. Parallel processing was the stone that was mocked as rough and unsightly and rejected. Parallel processing originated as a vague science fiction story that was dated February 1, 1922. From 1958 to 1989, the usefulness of the parallel super of supercomputing was debated in computer science literature. Parallel processing was the stone the builders of supercomputers rejected as rough and unsightly, only for it to become the crown jewel inside every supercomputer. My discovery of practical parallel supercomputing that occurred on the 4th of July, 1989, made the news headlines because that new knowledge was considered to be a paradigm shift or a change in the way we look at what makes the supercomputer super. In the old way, called sequential processing or vector processing, the supercomputer had only one electronic brain. In my new way, called parallel processing, the supercomputer is powered by 65,536 brains and can be powered by a billion brains. That was how I invented the Philip M. Aguale formula for the world's fastest supercomputer that then U.S. President Bill Clinton described in his White House speech of August 26, 2000. My signature invention was the fastest supercomputer that was not a computer per se, but that was a new internet de facto, that was a new global network of 65,536 processors that were tightly coupled to each other, that were equal distances apart from each other, that shared nothing between each other. Each processor operated its own operating system. The discovery of the new knowledge that is used to make the fastest computer super that occurred on the 4th of July 1989 was my direct moment. My contribution to the development of the computer is this. I answered a grand challenge question that was posed 67 years earlier, back on February 1, 1922. My invention timeline was this. Back in 1970 in Nigeria, I computed with a slide rule or a manually operated computer. Then on June 20, 1974, at 1800 Southwest, Campus Way, Cobalis, Oregon, United States. I began programming an automatic programmable supercomputer that was rated at 1 million instructions per second and ranked as the world's fastest supercomputer when it was manufactured back in December 1965. That supercomputer was only automatic within only one processor. 
the Philip Emma Aguani formula that then U.S. President Bill Clinton spoke about on August 26, 2000, was my discovery that we can solve a grand challenge initial boundary value problem that is the toughest and the most important problem in science and engineering and solve them automatically, both within and across each processor of my new internet that is a new global network of 65,536 processors that we are tightly coupled to each other. My contribution to the development of the supercomputer is this. I discovered how to make the supercomputers of the 1940s through 80s to become obsolete. Within the new supercomputer that I discovered on the 4th of July, 1989, 65,536 processors replaced the singular processor that computed alone. I invented practical parallel supercomputing, and I did so in two stages. First, I programmed all my two raised to power 16, or 65,536 processors to automatically send and receive my email codes and data and do so across 16 times as many email wires and to communicate with each of my 64 binary thousand processors. Second, I programmed each processor to automatically compute and do so simultaneously and across all 65,536 processors that uniformly encircled the globe as a new internet and encircled the globe in the manner computers encircle the earth. An internet is a global network of processors that encircles a globe. That internet might occupy the space of a soccer field or might encircle the earth itself. That internet might be a supercomputer de facto or might be the internet itself per se. The technology defines the name, not the name defines the technology. For my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing that occurred on the 4th of July, 1989, that subsequently made the news headlines, I defined my globe the way mathematicians prefer, namely as a 16-dimensional hypersphere within a 16-dimensional hyperspace. I visualized the two raised to power 16 or 64 binary thousand processors that I programmed and used to solve blind challenge problems as being equal distances apart and distributed across the 15 dimensional hypersurface of that hypersphere. In contrast to my neatly organized and interconnected processors, the computers that align the internet that encircle the earth we are added organically and incrementally and are non-identical to each other and non-equidistant from each other. And as a result of those irregularities and non-uniformities, the email communications between the computers on the internet must be asynchronously sent and received. And for that reason, the internet itself cannot be unnest and used to solve the grand challenge initial boundary value problems that is a recurring decimal in extreme scale mathematics and computational physics. The email messaging within my supercomputer is processor to processor emailing, not your everyday person to computer to computer to person emailing. I discovered practical parallel supercomputing when I figured out how to automatically program across my new internet and how to communicate synchronously while computing simultaneously and doing both as the precondition 
for recording the fastest computation that can arise from within the fastest computer in the world. That quote unquote fastest computer is not a computer per se. I discovered that the fastest computer is a virtual supercomputer that is an internet de facto. I was in the news headlines because I figured out how to harness the slowest processors in the world and harness them around a new internet and do so to record speeds in supercomputing that we are previously unrecorded. I invented the world's fastest computer that computes across a new internet that is a new global network of two raised to power 16 or 65,536 commodity of the shell processors that were if all distances apart from each other and that we are identical to each other and that we are tightly coupled to each other and that tightly encircled a globe that is shaped like a 16-dimensional hypersphere in 16-dimensional hyperspace. I also envision my new global network of 64 binary thousand processors as married together as one cohesive supercomputing machinery and married together by 16 times to raise to power 16 or 1,048,576 bidirectional email wires that were uniform and regular and that were etched onto the 15 dimensional surface of that globe that was shaped like a 16 dimensional hypersphere in hyperspace. In the modern configuration of supercomputers and at one foot per email wire, those email wires will total 200 miles of cable. This never before seen internet is called, is called the Philip M. Aguale internet. My Eureka moment of 8.15 in the morning of the 4th of July, 1989, made the news headlines around the globe in 1989 and did so because I was the first person to discover how to compute simultaneously and around a globe or how to compute around a new internet that is a new global network of tightly coupled processors that shared nothing between each other. That is, I de facto invented the world's fastest computer and I invented it by discovering how and why parallel processing is the vital technology that will make every supercomputer super. My world's fastest computation occurred after I discovered how to communicate synchronously and do so around a new global network of powers of two processors that is called the Philip Emma Aguale Internet. In the 1970s, my ideas of massively parallel supercomputing were not fully formed. For that reason, my earliest research reports were mocked and ridiculed, and I was off-handedly dismissed for espousing a beautiful theory that lacked an experimental confirmation. In the 1970s and 80s, massively parallel processing was dismissed as a supercomputing theory that will never gain many adherents. That is, the idea of harnessing the potential supercomputing power of an ensemble of 65,000 536 processors was ludicrous. That was the reason I was the only full-time programmer of that ensemble of two raised to power 16 processors. For the 10 years onward of 1979, my research report on the then unorthodox parallel supercomputer grew from a few pages to 1,057 pages. In 1989, my 40-page highlights of my 1,057-page research report won the top prize 
in supercomputing and made the news headlines. Looking back to the 1980s in the US, a rejection pattern that repeated itself dozens of times was this. I would get a telephone interview for a job that was advertised and get it because I had the most hands-on experience in supercomputing. During the interview, the interviewer is taken aback when he discovers that I am black and African born. In the 1970s and 80s, there were so few black vector supercomputer scientists that even I would have been shocked if I had seen a black African giving my lecture of massively parallel supercomputing. I experienced this cognitive dissonance the first time I attended a research seminar in Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1992 that was delivered by a very dark-skinned mathematician of African descent. She was known to the white mathematicians, but I, the only black mathematician in the audience, was the only person in the auditorium that was in a state of denial. It's ironic that the only black male mathematician in the audience of mathematicians was the only person that denied that the black female mathematician was a genius. Her lecture was on the ergodic theory of dynamical systems. I presume that she might not have the command of her materials. She proved me wrong. Similarly, it was presumed that it would be impossible to find a young black and gifted mathematician that can solve the toughest problem arising in extreme scale computational mathematics. That was the reason only one person attended my research seminar on supercomputing that I delivered in November 1982 in a large auditorium that was a short walk from the White House, Washington, D.C. My subsequent discovery of practical parallel processing that occurred seven years later and that made the news headlines was theorized in that supercomputing seminar that all but one person boycotted. By the late 1980s, I realized that my discovery that practical parallel processing will become the vital technology that will underpin every supercomputer will only be accepted if and only if white supercomputer scientists think that I am white. That was the reason I mailed the research report of my invention of practical parallel supercomputing to an independent committee of supercomputer scientists that were 2,500 miles away in San Francisco, California. The four members of that supercomputer committee were appointed by the president of the Computer Society that was the largest branch of the IEEE, the acronym for the Institute, Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. That is the world's largest technical society. The Computer Society was the world's largest of its kind. That committee of foremost experts in supercomputing we are taxed with awarding the top prize in supercomputing. The essence of the 40-page report that I submitted to the IEEE and the detailed 1057-page research report that won the prize in supercomputing is this. I discovered that practical parallel processing will become the vital technology that will underpin every supercomputer. The news of my invention of practical parallel, pa practical parallel supercomputing spread like wildfire and quickly made it to the dailies in many countries. I discovered how to harness a new internet that comprised of a global network of 65,000 536 processors that encircled a globe and how to harness that new internet to solve the toughest mathematical problems arising in science and engineering. And I discovered 
how to solve grand challenge problems and solve them 65,536 times faster than one process of solving the same problem alone. What is the future of the internet? I believe that in 1,000 years, our descendants will not have computers around them. Their computers will be within them instead of around them. Our posthuman descendants of the Armenian will not need computers because there will be computers that encircle and enshroud planet Earth. Our posthuman descendants will be half humans and half processors that are akin to the cyborgs in science fiction movies. I won the top award in supercomputing in 1989, and I did so for my contributions to the development of the practical parallel supercomputer. After years of being denied credit for my inventions, I learned to take the credit for my invention of practical parallel processing, the technology that underpins every supercomputer. I owe it to the 12-year-old writing an inventor report on Philip Emmanuel to keep the credit for my contributions that he or she is reporting on. That was the reason I spoke up for myself back in 1989 and showcased my contributions to the development of the computer. Success breeds jealousy and haters. Becoming a famous supercomputer scientist was like putting a large target on my back. Like any prominent black inventor of the past, I had doubters who envied me and worked tirelessly and anonymously to discredit my science. In 1989, I won the top prize in the field of supercomputing and did so for discovering how to solve a grand challenge problem and specifically for figuring out how to solve them across an ensemble of 65,536 processors. In 1989, I was the supercomputer scientist behind my discovery of how to harness a new parallel supercomputer and how to use that new technology to solve the toughest real-world problems such as fluid dynamical calculations called general circulation models of atmospheric and oceanic flows that are used to predict global warming and petroleum reservoir simulators that are used to recover more crude oil and natural gas that are buried one mile deep Within and within an oil field that is the size of a town. As the inventor of practical parallel supercomputing, I was the only person that could deliver the first public lecture that answers that grand challenge question. Being the inventor created deep grooves of my ownership of practical parallel supercomputing. And most importantly, I was the only supercomputer scientist of the 1980s that can show someone else how to massively parallel process and how to do so across a new internet that is a new global network of 65,536 processors. That command of materials and deep knowledge of mathematics, physics, and supercomputing, and that control via emails of my 64 binary thousand processors made my lectures of massively parallel supercomputing more authoritative as well as compelling. As a research mathematician, I stood out because I was the only person that recorded the world's fastest speed in supercomputing and did so while solving the initial boundary value problem of mathematical physics. That achievement 
was the reason I was the only person that won the top prize in the field of supercomputing and won it alone. And did so when up to 50 persons are teaming up to win that prize. A century ago, the average scientific paper had only one author. Today, the average scientific paper has six authors. The paper on the experimental discovery of the Higgs boson had 3,061 co-discoverers of the Higgs boson. A boson is an elementary particle that is believed to be responsible for all physical forces. For my country of birth, Nigeria, poverty cannot be reduced by searching for huge deposits for a huge deposit of crude oil and natural gas and discovering it in Sokoto of the far northeastern region of Nigeria. Poverty alleviation cannot be achieved from recovering only 50% of that crude oil deposit and then paying 40% of that 50% as exploration royalty to a foreign company. That's like recovering only 30% of the crude oil and natural gas that was originally discovered. Economic growth for all producing nations such as Nigeria resides in having the brain power to earn the remaining 70% of the potential revenue from the Niger Delta oil fields of the southeastern region of Nigeria. The first step in alleviating poverty in Africa is to increase Africa's intellectual capital and do so by reversing the brain drain from Africa to the United States and do so by also attracting skilled non-Africans such as African Americans to live and work in Africa and do so by Africans being at the frontier of human knowledge and Africans being at that unknown world where African innovators could imagine the unimaginable. Discoveries and inventions are to science and technology what new songs and new movies are to the entertainment industry. The invention is to technology what the new song is to music. Inventions make living easier for everybody. Discoveries make the world a better place and a more knowledgeable one. I'm Philip Emanuele. The internet has many fathers and mothers, as well as aunts and uncles, that did not invent a new internet. The father of the internet should at least invent a new internet. I am called a father of the internet because I am the only father of the internet that invented a new internet. Back in 1989, I was in the news headlines because I was the first person to discover how to parallel process real world problems and how to do so across millions upon millions of processors that were tightly coupled to each other. In parallel supercomputing across my new internet that was a new global network of 65,536 processors that were identical to each other. The most important knowledge is to fully understand how to control and harness every processor that was within my global network of processors. Each processor operated its own operating system. In 1989, I made the news headlines when I recorded the maximum possible speed increase across my ensemble of 65,536 commodity of the shelf processors. That parallel processed speed increase of a factor of 65,536 that was then considered impossible led to my discovery that 
parallel supercomputing will be the vital technology that will make computers faster and make supercomputers fastest. I discovered practical parallel supercomputing and did so by making a one-to-one -one corresponded and metaphorical mapping and doing so from the vertices of the hypercube to each processor and by making another one-to-one -one corresponded mapping from the bidirectional edges of the hypercube to my email wires. Unlike your cube, my hypercube was defined in 16-dimensional hyperspace and therefore has two raised to power 16 or 64 binary thousand vertices and 16 times as many or one binary million bidirectional edges. Programming 64 binary thousand tightly coupled processors to work together to forecast the weather was in the realm of science fiction and would have been dismissed as an act of insanity and dismissed when I began programming supercomputers back on June 20, 1974 at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon, United States. But on the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States, I discovered how to turn that science fiction into non-fiction that is used to forecast the weather for your evening news. As the first person to make the news headlines for discovering practical parallel supercomputing, I visualized the vertices and the edges of a hypercube that were etched onto the surface of my hypersphere. I invented the Philip M. Aguale internet as corresponding to the cut-out silhouette that was my topological metaphor for the appearance of my new internet that has a new global network of 65,536 processors that were identical to each other and that we are tightly coupled to each other. That new supercomputer and the new internet were like tightly conjoined twins with only one super brain. In 1989, I was in the news headlines because I discovered practical parallel supercomputing and invented it as the vital technology that now underpins every supercomputer and that enabled me to compute faster and across my new internet and to compute faster than any supercomputer that ever existed. I envision my new virtual supercomputer as my new internet. My first visions of my new internet began as a dark shape and as an outline of a blank global network of processors that we are connected with email wires, that we are empty messages. That dark shape of my new internet remained visible inside my mind. It's impossible for me to walk alone and program that new internet and do so without intellectually seeing the exact positions in 16 dimensional space of each of my 65,536 processors. It's also impossible for me to send and receive email messages across my 1,048,576 bidirectional email wires and do so correctly without knowing in advance the exact positions in hyperspace of my 65,536 processors. As the first parallel supercomputer scientist, I was not trying to see with my naked eyes any of my 65,536 processors or any of my 1,048,576 bidirectional email wires that married my commodity processors together and did so to form a new internet that tightly circumscribed a globe 
in 16-dimensional hyperspace. In contrast, I only saw my new supercomputer and my new internet inside my mind, not with my naked eyes, as was often presumed. In a sense, I saw my new internet in its entirety, the way you saw our planet Earth in its entirety, and understood that it is not flat, and do so with your mind, not with, by encircling it around the Earth in a spacecraft. I visualized how to email my 65,536 computer codes, as well as email the as many sets of data that I used at the mathematical physics core of my initial boundary value problems. That was how I preloaded each of my 65,536 processors. I visualized how to continuously pump my email messages across my new internet. I visualized each of my email messages as having five subject lines and having no message body and as traversing across my new global network of 1,048,576 email wires that outlined my new internet. In my mind, I sketched my silhouette as the dark shadow of a new internet that encircles the earth. That shadow was created by the sun. The partial differential equations that I invented are the most advanced expressions in calculus. Those partial differential equations are far more abstract than the quadratic equation, and for that reason, the layperson cannot scribble them across the blackboard or solve them on or across motherboards. The system of nine partial differential equations that I invented are abstract and are de facto invincible. However, I use those partial differential equations as my extreme scaled computational test beds for inventing a new computer, a new supercomputer, and a new internet. In the lecture series of my contributions to mathematics that I posted on Emma Agwale on youtube.com slash Emma Agwale. I described in prose rather than in abstract mathematics how I coded my initial boundary value problem that we are grounded, that we are governed by a system of partial differential equations of calculus. And I did so differently. I did not code my initial boundary value problem for only one processor, as was done by other computational mathematicians. I paradigm shifted by parallel supercomputing my initial boundary value problem and doing so across a new internet that is a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors. That solitary act of repetitive coding for each processor that defined and outlined that new internet was my form of meditation. The very essence of my ensemble of processors was to use emails to weave together my new global network of 64 binary thousand processors and to invent a new internet that is one whole cohesive virtual supercomputer that is not a computer per se. In my mind, those 64 binary thousand slowest processors were de facto the fastest supercomputer. That was my metaphor for a futuristic, thought provoking, and poetic internet. That is, I retort my new computer as my new internet and vice versa. I visualize my email messages as traversing across the interior of the 16-dimensional hyperspace and along the bidirectional edges 
of the hypercube in that hyperspace. I gave form to that ensemble and gave form to it as a never before seen internet. For me, that new global network of processors that we are tightly coupled to each other, that we are equal distances apart from each other, and that shared nothing between each other became a mathematized and abstracted internet that is a singular virtual supercomputer. I was in the news in 1989 and thereafter because I was the first person to parallel process across a new internet that was a new global network of 65,536 processors that shared nothing between them. I was the first person to theoretically discover that no upper limit exists when parallel supercomputing across an infinite number of processors. Put differently, my inspiration is this. The science fiction of planetary parallel supercomputing across the entire internet that encircled planet Earth could become the non-fiction of our descendants. I was the first person to discover how to parallel process across a new internet that I visualized as a small copy of the planet-sized internet. For that invention that was conceived back in 1974 and completed in 1989, whenever the phrase father of the internet is mentioned, the first name that Google suggests is Philip Emanuele. The contributions to the development of the computer that are the subject of school reports are inventions that are paradigm shifting or that change the way we look at the computer. The objective criterion for measuring contributions to the development of the computer is fixed, namely, the fastest computation that was executed by any means necessary. My fastest computation that I discovered on the 4th of July 1989 was executed by parallel supercomputing a grand challenge initial boundary value problem of extreme scale computational physics and solving it across a new internet that was a new global network of 65,000 536 processors that were tightly coupled to each other, that were identical to each other, that were equal distances apart from each other, but that shared nothing between each other. My scientific discovery that occurred on the 4th of July 1989 was that parallel processing will become the vital technology that will make the modern supercomputer super. That discovery made the news headlines because it will change the way we look at the computer. I discovered that we should look at the modern computer, not as a computing machinery per se, but as a new internet de facto. That never before seen internet derives its supercomputer horsepower by parallel processing its computational workload across its millions of, of processors that were tightly coupled to each other with each processor operating its own operating system. For me, Philip M. Aguale, that technological breakthrough in massively parallel processing was the supercomputer news headlines that crossed the sea from San Francisco, California to Onitsha, Nigeria, and crossed the sea because it broke new grounds of supercomputing across 65,536 tightly coupled processors that equidistantly encircled a globe that defined and outlined a new internet. Back on June 20, 1974, at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon, United States, I began programming the first computer to be rated at 1 million instructions per second. 
the first computer, supercomputer was invented in 1946. That first supercomputer was 100 feet long, 10 feet wide, 10 feet tall, and 3 feet deep. So supercomputers were programmed for 28 years before I began to do so. But those supercomputers only solved one problem at a time instead of solving a billion problems at once. But at 8.15 in the morning of the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States, I became the first person to discover practical parallel supercomputing. That discovery made the news headlines because it was said to be impossible to parallel process a grand challenge problem and do so across a new internet that is a new global network of unlimited number of processors that were tightly coupled to each other and that shared nothing between each other. The grand challenge problems solved on supercomputers remain essentially the same, but the value and size of the supercomputer market has grown from $7 million back in 1946 to $20 billion a year, or a factor of 3,000. The information technology market is $5 trillion, with more than 40% of that market in North America, primarily in the United States, where nearly 2 million skilled persons are employed in the IT sector. The supercomputer that Japan has on its drawing board will cost $1.25 billion. As a massively parallel supercomputer scientist that came of age in the 1970s and 80s, I walked and walked alone because I took the road less traveled. But I also got noticed more because I did my parallel supercomputer research under unusual circumstances that took me from Onitsha to Oregon back on March 23, 1974. In the 1970s and 80s, no sub-Saharan African-born scientific researcher was hired by any of the numerous U.S. nuclear research laboratories where most supercomputing research was conducted. In 1989, I discovered that a grand challenge problem can be divided into millions of smaller, less challenging problems. And then I further discovered that I could use as many email messages to puzzle together those small problems into the original grand challenge problem that I could then solve across my new internet that is my new global network of as many processors that each operated its own operating system and that each shared nothing with other nearest neighboring processors. I'm Philip Emma Aguale. Back in 1989, I was in the news headlines because I discovered how the slowest processors can be parallel processed and harnessed to solve once impossible to solve problems and solve them at previously impossible speeds. My discovery created a need for the parallel supercomputer. My discovery of practical parallel supercomputing made the news headlines because it was akin to discovering an undiscovered continent of the unknown world of the new computer and the new internet. The use of 64,000 human computers to parallel process the weather was published as a science fiction story back on February 1, 1922, and published in the book titled Weather Prediction by Numerical Process. The contribution of Philip M. Aguale to the development of the computer is this. I upgraded parallel supercomputing from fiction to non-fiction. So for 67 years onward of 1922, parallel processing 
was the big and unanswered question of the field of computing. And for that reason, the quest to answer it was described as the grand challenge problem of the field of supercomputing for 67 years onward of 1922. Mathematical scientists attempted to solve the toughest initial boundary value problems and to solve them by dividing each into smaller problems that could be parallel processed with one problem to one processor correspondence and mapped onto one million identical processors that were tightly coupled to each other. Until my discovery of the 4th of July, 1989, Progress in solving such grand challenge problems and solving them by parallel processing them was a modest factor of eight. That factor was erroneously decreed by Amla's law of diminishing returns expected from the increase in the speed of supercomputers. My contribution to supercomputing is this. I figured out how parallel supercomputing works. And that discovery changed the way we look at the supercomputer that occupies the space of the soccer field and changed the way we look at the fastest computer that can be placed on your desk. The computer is a machinery that performs fast calculations. The massively parallel supercomputer is the fastest computer. The Philip M. Aguale Internet is a global network of commodity of the shelf processors that we are identical to each other, that we are tightly coupled to each other, that we are equal distances apart from each other, from each other that shared nothing between each other. Each processor operated its own operating system. My contributions to knowledge is this. I discovered a new internet that is a new global network of processors or tiny computers that is not a computer per se, but that is a new, that is a supercomputer de facto. Who invented the internet? The internet has many fathers and mothers, as well as aunts and uncles. But only one father of the internet invented a new internet. The father of the internet should at least contribute new technological knowledge that pertains to the internet and do so by inventing a new internet. I am called a father of the internet because I am the only father of the internet that invented a new internet. I was asked, when the games are over, how will you want to be remembered? What's been around the longest will stay around the longest. One million years ago, our pre-human ancestors counted on their fingers and toes. I believe that in a million years, our post-human descendants will count across their year million internet. I will be remembered the longest for my contributions to computational mathematics that changed the way we count and changed it from counting only one thing at a time to counting a billion things at once. I will be remembered for my contributions that changed the way we looked at the computer and changed it from one isolated process of computing only one thing at a time to one billion processors, supercomputing for the parallel processed solution of the toughest real world problems. We remember mathematicians from 3,000 years ago 
if and only if their contributions to mathematics is still relevant. We remember Euclid as the father of geometry because the geometry, because geometry is taught in schools. We remember the, huh, the we will remember the computational mathematician that changed the way we count. Since prehistoric times, our pre-human ancestors counted only one thing at a time. I discovered that we could, count, we could solve real world problems by counting a billion things at once or by parallel supercomputing the toughest mathematical problems. We will remember the father of the internet. If and only if the internet is still relevant in a million. I am the only father of the internet that invented a new internet. I will be remembered as the first parallel supercomputer scientist that came of age on the 4th of July 1989. That is my legacy and my contribution to human knowledge that changed the world of computers. I was inducted by the United Nations into its gallery of prominent refugees. The United Nations distributed posters of Philip M. Aguale to refugee camps in Kenya, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone. And I was getting emails from those refugee camps inviting me to visit their camps. What is Philip M. Aguale famous for? I became known by word of mouth and as follows. In 1989, a 12 year old wrote a school inventor report on the contributions of Philip M. Aguale to the development of the computer. That school inventor report is discussed with her classmates and at her family dinner table or during conversations with her younger friends. The following year, those younger friends are more likely to write school inventor reports on Philip M. Aguale. That word of mouth spreading of school inventor reports and its stickiness is more effective than media mentions. Often students forget how to spell the name Philip M. Aguale, but they have no problem remembering to search for the Nigerian who invented the fastest computer or the African who invented a new internet that is a new global network of processors. I became known via newspaper and magazine articles that were published after my discovery of practical parallel processing, pa practical parallel supercomputing that occurred on the 4th of July, 1989. I discovered practical parallel supercomputing and discovered it as the vital technology that will make the supercomputer super. The first audience to discover my story were American school children writing school reports on the team, famous mathematicians and their contributions to mathematics, or great scientists in history of great inventors and their inventions. Some of those children wrote school reports on Philip M. Aguale and did so in part because their father or mother wrote a school report on Philip M. Aguale. The second audience that discovered my contributions to science were Nigerians and Africans in the continent and in the diaspora. Shortly after the Christmas of 1989 in San Francisco, California, the office of the largest technical organization called the IEEE, as well as some other institutions, issued press releases that announced that I had discovered practical parallel supercomputing and discovered it as the vital technology that will power every supercomputer and that I had invented 
how to under 65,536 processors to solve the toughest initial boundary value problems arising in mathematical physics and that I had discovered how to solve that grand challenge problem and solve it at the world's fastest supercomputer speeds and that I had solved the problem at the then on hard of speed of 3.1 billion calculations per 3.1 billion floating point arithmetical operations per second. Those 1989 press releases of my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing we are picked up by newspapers and magazines, and I began getting requests for media interviews. For the decade preceding 1989, I was mocked and made fun of while I worked alone on parallel supercomputing. But as I became famous, those vector supercomputer scientists that mocked and made fun of me and that refused to work jointly with me and become my co-discoverer of practical parallel supercomputing, turned around and insisted that they will now become my new best friend and that I should allow them to become my co-inventors. Their motive was this. If they had collaborated with me and did so for only one minute, they would have gone to the court to fight for a share of the credit for my invention of practical parallel supercomputing and for the invention that I had already invented and invented without there any contribution from them. In the old style of supercomputing, the conventional supercomputer solves grand challenge initial boundary value problems arising in extreme scale computational physics and takes forever to solve them in a step-by-step -step fashion that is called serial computing. On the 4th of July, 1989, I discovered a new way of solving those grand challenge problems, namely shortening them into a million smaller, less challenging initial boundary value problems, and then simultaneously solving them across a million processors and solving them in a one problem to one processor corresponded mapping that will result in a million fold speed increase. I visualize my processors as identical to each other and as equal distances apart from each other and as interconnected by identical email wires that were lying on the surface of a globe that was represented by a hypersphere in a 16-dimensional hyperspace. In my July 4, 1989 physical parallel supercomputing experiment that made the news headlines in 1989, I divided the grand challenge initial boundary value problem of simulating the flow of crude oil, injected water, and natural gas across an oil field that is one mile deep and that is the size of a town. I did so by dividing that oil field into two raised to power 16 or 65,536 smaller oil fields. I emailed my supercomputer codes and their companion data that I used to simulate each of my smaller oil fields and emailed them to and from 16 bit long email addresses and I emailed them along 16 times to raise to power 16 email wires. That is, I emailed my data and codes across a new internet and into each processor within my new global network of 64 binary thousand processors that were equal distances apart and that were on the surface of a globe in the 16th dimension. That was how I solved the grand challenge problem of supercomputing and how I discovered how parallel process makes the computer faster and makes the supercomputer fastest and discovered how to always manufacture the world's fastest computer and do so with the technology of 
massively parallel processing. I was born on August 23, 1954, in a small hospital in the British West African colony of Nigeria. The first house that I lived in was the boys' quarter of a small house for servants that was associated with a big house that was at the intersection of KMSO Street and Oba Adesida Road, Akure, Nigeria, British West Africa. My mother, Inamma Agatha Emma Abale, had just celebrated her 15th birthday and did so six days before I was born. The precursor to the modern computer was eight years old when I was born. In 1954, the British colony of Nigeria had a population of 40 million and then had only 150 lawyers, 160 medical doctors, and one trained engineer. When I was born, the word computer was not in the Nigerian vocabulary. Even in the US, the word supercomputer was not in the vocabulary of computer programmers of 1946 through 1967. The word supercomputer was first used in 1967. When I say, quote unquote, the internet, I mean the global network of computers that encircles planet Earth. When I say, quote unquote, an internet, I mean a global network of processes that encircles a globe. I use the word internet to describe my global network of commodity of the shelf processors that were tightly coupled to each other, that shared nothing between each other. I visualize the emails that I sent to and received from each of my 64 binary thousand processors as having traveled along my 1,048,000 576 email wires that I visualize as etched onto the 15 dimensional hypersurface of a globe that is a hypersphere. In my, in my 16th dimensional mathematical hyperspace, the actual global circulation model that is used for climate studies that inspired my invention of my new internet that is a, that is that is that new global network of 65,536 processors was also defined around the globe in three-dimensional physical space. The geophysical flows of air and water are at the core of global warming simulations that are at the core of global warming simulations we are modeled by using a set of laws of physics that always includes the second law of motion of physics that was discovered 330 years ago. The second law of motion was encoded into a system of coupled, nonlinear, time dependent, and three dimensional partial differential equations that I discretized and reduced to a system of equations of algebra that I parallel processed across 64 binary thousand commodity of the shelf processors that were tightly coupled to each other and that shared nothing between each other. That is, I discovered how to simulate the planetary motions of the air and water that enshroud the earth that is a globe of 7,917 and a half miles in diameter. I discovered how to simulate and parallel process around a new global network of processors that is a new internet and a new supercomputer to factor. That was how I invented a new internet that encircled a globe and how I invented that internet and used it to solve a grand challenge initial boundary value problem that enshrouded a globe, namely 
planet Earth. At its mathematical physics core, that grand challenge problem is an extreme scaled computational physics school developed for the high resolution simulation that must be used to predict global warming. In the geometry of higher dimensions, the globe is defined and outlined by a hypersphere that in turn is defined as a set of points at equal distance from a given point called the center. In my physical experiment that revealed the world's fastest supercomputer and revealed it on July 4, 1989, I visualized my 64 binary thousand commodity of the shell processors that used high speed interconnects that comprised of one binary million email wires as evenly distributed around a mathematical globe in the 16th dimension that in turn was projected and etched onto the two dimensional surface of a physical globe in the third dimension. The hypersphere that I used to define my two raised to power 16 commodity of the shell processors is my generalization of the sphere to the 16th dimension. The hypercube is the similar generalization of the cube from the third dimension to the 16th. I visualize my virtual supercomputer, not as a computer as others did, but as a new internet that is a new global network of processors. I was in the news because I figured out how to harness my 65,536 processors and how to command and control them to automatically send and synchronously receive the codes and data associated with my as many initial boundary value problems of mathematical physics. Those codes and data traveled through 16 times, to raised to power 16, or one binary million by directional email wires that had a one email wire to one hypercube edge correspondence to the as many bidirectional edges of the hypercube in the 16th dimensional mathematical hyperspace. By comparison, your everyday emails are manually sent to you and delivered via a computer. Your email that traveled from Nigeria to the United States was routed across the globe or the internet. That internet encircled planet Earth, that is a globe that has a diameter of 7,917 and a half miles. In contrast, my emails around my global network of processors were automated and synchronized across an ensemble of 65,536 processors that I visualized as a new internet in the 16th dimension. I visualized my new internet as defined across the surface of a hypersphere, that is a globe in higher dimensions, that in turn tightly enshrouded a hypercube, that is a cube in higher dimensions. I visualized the 16 times to raise to power 16 or the one binary million bidirectional edges as projected onto its 15 dimensional hypersurface. The honeycomb was the first of my two diagrammatic expressions of my new global networks of commodity of the shell processors that were identical to each other, that were equal distances apart from each other, that shared nothing between each other, in which, in which each processor operated its own operating system. To others, my honeycomb and hyperbole diagrams represented a supercomputer, but I emphasize that it was also a new internet, that is, a new global network of processors that tightly circumscribed a globe in three dimensional space and in 16 dimensional hyperspace, respectively. 
that distinction was pivotal. Those two inventions were the reasons I became most searched for and the recurring decimal in discussions on the contributions of the black man that invented a new internet. I'm Philip Emmanuel. I am the only father of the internet that invented a new internet. Thank you. The inventor discovered the possibilities in the world of the impossible. My quest for a never before seen massively parallel supercomputer that was also a new internet de facto was to discover the possibilities in the world of the impossible or to show that the impossible to compute is in fact possible to compute. The quest for new knowledge is akin to walking at night and and along a narrow footpath in the forest and doing so with a dim lamp. My massively parallel supercomputer research was my personal quest for the new way to the unknown world of the never before seen ensemble of millions of processors that were identical to each other, that were equal distances apart from each other, that outline and define a new internet that is a virtual supercomputer de facto. In the 1970s and 80s, I walked alone along that path and I was only guided by a dim lamp. Kwame Nkrumah said, socialism without science is void. And said, Forward ever, backward never. Kwame Nkrumah also said, we face neither east nor west, we face forward. I say that science moves humanity forward ever. Back on the 4th of July, 1989, I discovered that a new internet that is comprised of a new global network of, of the slowest 65,536 processors can be harnessed and used to solve the toughest problems arising in science and engineering and used to solve those problems faster than any supercomputer. China copied that massively parallel supercomputing technology and updated it from my 65,536 processors to its world's fastest supercomputer that is powered by 10,649,600 processors. Parallel processing is the crown jewel inside every supercomputer. My discovery of practical parallel supercomputing helped China to assemble some of the world's fastest supercomputers. That discovery is the vital technology that upgraded China as one of the world's supercomputing superpower. However, the race to build the world's fastest supercomputer is the race to knowledge, not the race to the moon. My discovery of practical parallel supercomputing that occurred on the 4th of July 1989 put the super into the supercomputer. My discovery of practical parallel supercomputing is akin to having 10,649,600 election polling stations in Nigeria and having only 19 voters queued at each polling station and consequently completing the election in 19 minutes instead of in 380 years. That reduction of election time from four centuries of time to election to merely 20 minutes is the basic principle that changed the way we understand how to put the super 
into the supercomputer. The discovery of practical parallel supercomputing that occurred on the 4th of July, 1989, opened our eyes and enabled us to see the supercomputer in a different way. How does the new, the new parallel supercomputer benefit you? The next time the weather forecast made you reach for your umbrella, you did so because the parallel supercomputer was used to make that forecast. The next time you drive your car, you did so in part because the parallel supercomputer was used to discover and recover the crude oil that was refined as the fuel in your car. That is the reason one in ten supercomputers are purchased by the petroleum industry. If you were evacuating your family and doing so in response to a tsunami flooding or an earthquake warning, then you should send a thank you note to your parallel supercomputer scientist for enabling the tsunami or earthquake forecast that saved your family's lives. And if you own a self-driving car, you should credit that technology to the parallel supercomputer that is within your self-driving car that enables it to train itself over time. And that's how the new parallel supercomputer benefits you. I'm Philip Emagwale. The modern supercomputer has existed for three quarters of a century. The vector supercomputer has existed since the 1970s. In 1989, the vector supercomputer had a billion dollars in sale. Today, the vector supercomputer has been replaced with a parallel supercomputer that in turn has a market size of $20 billion a year. A massively parallel supercomputer that is on the Japanese drawing board will cost $1.25 billion. In real world computational physics, the supercomputer that cost $1.25 billion is an inex inexpensive alternative to physical experiments that range from modeling the flow of blood through the cardiovascular system to simulating the flows of crude oil and natural gas that are flowing one mile deep and flowing underneath the surface of the earth and flowing across and flowing and flowing across the surface of the earth and flowing across a porous medium that is the size of a town. It is far cheaper to simulate a petroleum reservoir and do so without constructing a cumbersome physical scale model of the Niger Delta production oil field of the southeastern region of Nigeria. The extreme skilled computational physicists don't actively inject water into the petroleum reservoir. The computational physicist plays a what if simulation scenarios and plays that game with her parallel processed simulations of the multi phase flows of crude oil, natural gas, and injected water. That high resolution extreme scale petroleum reservoir simulation that is massively parallel processed across millions upon millions of commodity processors enables the petroleum geologist to be confident about pinpointing the locations of crude oil and natural gas. Back in 1989, I won the top prize in the field of supercomputing and I won it for my contributions to the parallel supercomputer. The proof that my discovery was groundbreaking was that it made the news headlines and was highlighted in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal. Prior to my discovery of, of parallel supercomputing that occurred on the 4th of July, 1989, I did not have a record of, major, of making major scientific discoveries. 
Back in, 19, in the 1980s, computational physicists rejected my research on a massively parallel supercomputer and did so in part because they could not understand how I was able to message pass computational fluid dynamics codes and do so to and from my 65,536 processors. Because message passing was unknown and was not in the textbooks of the 1980s, my parallel supercomputing research was rejected by research mathematicians on the grounds that it was not a subfield of mathematics. My parallel supercomputing research was rejected by research physicists on the grounds that it was not a subfield of physics. And computer scientists rejected my parallel supercomputing research and did so because its computational fluid dynamics components, such as modeling the weather above and below the surface of the Earth, was also not a subfield of computer science. That rejection was the reason I was the only full-time programmer and the only person that developed the ability to parallel process across an ensemble of 64 binary thousand commodity of the shelf processors that were tightly coupled to each other, that shared nothing between each other, and that were identical to each other. But most importantly, I understood that I had to record a speed increase of a factor of 65,536 that was a world record in supercomputer speed up. I had to use that unprecedented speed up as my performance metric that will put a specific number on my contributions to the development of the modern supercomputer. I did not merely solve my initial boundary value problem on a processor or a computer. The reason I was the cover stories of top publications in mathematics was that I discovered how to solve initial boundary value problems arising in physics, calculus, and algebra, and discovered how to solve them across a new internet that is a new global network of powers of two processors. My new internet was a new supercomputer, de facto, that is a million times more complex than a singular supercomputer that was powered by only one processor that was not a member of an ensemble of processors. My discovery of that speed up across processors is my contribution to the development of the modern supercomputer. My contribution changed the way we do computational physics and changed it from sequentially processed small scale computational physics to parallel processed extreme scaled computational physics. My contribution to the development of the supercomputer changed the way we compute and changed it from slowly computing in sequence to supercomputing in parallel. My contribution to the development of the fastest supercomputer changed the way we compute and changed it from counting only one thing at a time to counting up to a billion things at once. My contribution to parallel supercomputing is a paradigm shift in computer science. Parallel supercomputing was vaguely mentioned as a science fiction back on February 1, 1922, and in the book titled Weather Prediction by Numerical Process. For seven decades thereafter, parallel supercomputing remained in science fiction until I discovered it 
on the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States. My contribution to the development of the computer is this. I moved the parallel supercomputer from science fiction books to science textbooks. I was the lone wolf supercomputer scientist, supercomputer inventor that discovered parallel processing. My confidence as a parallel supercomputer scientist did not come from vector supercomputer scientists who in the first place believed that the massively parallel supercomputer will forever remain a huge waste of everybody's time. My confidence that I could solve the toughest problem arising in supercomputing came from within me and from the command of materials that I possessed. Confidence comes from being the most prepared and the most knowledgeable. Progress does not always come from always being right. Progress comes from not fearing to be wrong. There is a great difference between a scientific fact and a science fiction. Back on February 1, 1922, parallel processing was theorized for accurate weather forecasting. But the technology was not then a science fact, but was a science fiction. On July 4, 1989, and 67 years after parallel processing was described as a science fiction, I discovered that that, par that parallel science fiction, I discovered that, pa that parallel supercomputing is a science fact, it is a scientific fact. I once asked a friend why he left journalism to become a fiction writer. He said, journalism deals with facts, while fiction deals with truths. In the 1970s and 80s, my quest for the fastest supercomputer that was then hidden in the unknown world of massively parallel supercomputing was for a scientific truth not a science fiction. My new parallel processed way of counting one billion things at once and across as many processors is a mathematical truth, not a mathematical fiction. The writer is a generalist. The poet chisels words the novelist describes the human condition, but it's the scientific discoverer that changes the human condition. After 16 years, onward of June 20, 1974, of programming 16 supercomputers, I knew that no supercomputer scientist was on my heels in that race to become the first person to discover the world's fastest supercomputer that solves a million problems at once or in parallel. The new supercomputer attained its world record speed across a new internet that was a new global network of 65,536 commodity of the shelf processors that were equal distances apart. On the 4th of July, 1989, I recorded and discovered the fastest possible parallel processed supercomputer speed. After my, disco my discovery, parallel processing became synonymous with supercomputing and became the gateway to extreme scale computational physics and became the solution path to the toughest problems arising in mathematics. The supercomputer is the workhorse of mathematics and physics.
my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing was public, publicly unveiled at the award ceremony of the 35th IEEE Computer Society's International Conference that took place on February 28, 1990 in San Francisco, California. I did not invent parallel supercomputing overnight. Should we value science more than literature? Literature describes while science explains. Literature gave us parallel processing as a science fiction story and did so on February 1, 1922. But it was science that turned that science fiction into non-fiction and did so on July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States, the date and place that I discovered that parallel processing will forever remain the vital technology that makes computers faster and makes supercomputers fastest. Leonardo da Vinci was at the crossroad of science and art. The contributions to knowledge of great scientists like Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, and Marie Curie carried greater gravitas than the writings of great novelists like Ernest Hemingway, Charles Dickens, and Jane Austen. Unraveling the mysteries of the universe carries heavier gravitas than telling the story of a person. This is the reason that about 100 scientists have been portrayed on currencies but William Shakespeare that is considered to be the greatest writer of all time is not on any currency. An airport or hospital or university can be named after a historical figure in science, but not after a historical figure in literature. International airports are named after Nikola Tesla, Copernicus, and Leonardo da Vinci but none are named after William Shakespeare. The memorialization of words lacks the depth of that of scientists such as Albert Einstein or political figures like Nelson Mandela. A poem is not as important as the internet. A well-known poet confessed that this poetry is useless, but not harmful. The storyteller cannot become the hero of the heroism he is basking in. The biographical writer's fame is a reflected glory that is achieved through writing about a famous person rather than through doing what made that person famous. Three weeks after my 19th birth date in Nigeria, I received a scholarship letter from Mormont, Oregon, United States, that was dated September 10, 1973. That scholarship letter opened the door for me to enter into the United States. I received that scholarship not because I was good looking, but because I was good in mathematics and physics. That first and subsequent scholarships were renewed for 16 years and renewed across six American universities. In February 1991, the last of those six universities did something it never did before in its two century history. That university devoted a special issue of its flagship quarterly publication to a supercomputer scientist named Philip Emma Aguale that it described as one of the world's smartest humans. The essence of that story spread like wildfire and is repeated decades later and across social media 
And whatever the subject of conversation is about the world's smartest persons. When I was five years old, back in January 1960, I enrolled in St. Patrick's Primary School, Sapele, Western Region, Nigeria. For the five-year-old, his frontier of mathematical knowledge is the arithmetical times table that was unknown to him, but was known to mathematicians that lived 5,000 years earlier and along the valley of the River Nile of Africa. When I was nine years old, back in January 1964, I enrolled in St. John's Primary School, Abo, Midwest Region, Nigeria. For the nine-year-old, his frontier of mathematical knowledge was the quadratic equation of algebra. The quadratic equation taught in high school was derived over the past 4,000 years, dating back to North Africa. Growing up in the 1960s post-colonial Africa, I had no sense of the history of mathematical inventions. I had no sense of who discovered the time table. I had no sense of who invented the quadratic equation. I had no idea that 30 years later, I would be in major US newspapers for inventing nine partial differential equations of calculus and for inventing the as many companion finite difference equations of algebra that in turn approximates those partial differential equations. As a small boy growing up in the early years of post-colonial Nigeria, I presumed that the times table in my arithmetic textbook and the quadratic equation in my algebra textbook had been known to textbook authors since time immemorial. I presumed that Adam and Eve studied the quadratic equation in their Garden of Eden. As a teenager in Nigeria, my greatest epiphany was that the arithmetical times table and the algebraic quadratic equation did not spontaneously create themselves as I grew, I learned that the partial differential equation of calculus were not known to our distant ancestors that hunted wildlife and gathered fruits. I learned that calculus was invented three centuries and three decades ago, and that the partial differential equation was invented merely a century and a half ago. As a small boy growing up in Nigeria, I had no sense that the earth was round. I had no sense that the earth is merely 4.6 billion years old. I had no sense that our universe is 13.8 billion years old. I had no sense that humans had merely roamed the earth for only 100,000 years. As a small boy in Nigeria, I thought that arithmetical and algebraic knowledge came fossilized with the dinosaurs, that we are the monstrous lizards that roam the earth and did so from 252 million years ago to 66 million years ago. The contributions to science of scientists born in Africa will increase during the 21st century. And the reason is that by the mid-21st century, one in two children will be born in Africa. My country of birth, Nigeria, has 200 million people and is more than half the population of the United States and could be as, pop as populous as the United States or, or 400 million people by the year 2050. In the year 2050, Africa could, could de facto become the face of humanity. For that reason, the African child born today 
will become the custodian of tomorrow's technology. Nigeria needs more scientists than the United States. If Africa has 60% of the world's arable land, why then is Africa importing food from Europe? The answer is that Africa lacks the knowledge that pertains to science and technology. We have African inventors, but no African inventions. Is there a school subject called African science? Is there an African quadratic equation? Is there an African medicine or African magic? Or is there an African law of physics or an African supercomputer? Why is Philip M. Aguale famous? Why is Philip M. Aguale important to the world of computers? In 1989, I was in the news as the African supercomputer genius that won top US prize. I was in the news because I discovered how to produce the world's fastest supercomputers and how to manufacture them from a large ensemble of the world's slowest processors that were identical to each other, that were equal distances apart from each other, and that shared nothing between each other. That discovery from my parallel supercomputing experiment of July 4, 1989 is the foundation of the modern supercomputer that now computes and communicates in parallel. That discovery of practical parallel supercomputing added a new pillar for the never-ending quest for faster and faster supercomputers. I discovered practical parallel supercomputing as the new technology that will underpin future computers and supercomputers. To stand at the farthest frontier of supercomputer knowledge was a surreal feeling that gave me goosebumps. On my miracle moment of 8.15 in the morning of the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States, I saw for the first time a never-before-seen supercomputer. That virtual supercomputer was beyond the computer and is not a computer per se. It is a new internet, de facto. Why is Philip M. Aguale important to the world of mathematics. Studying mathematics and understanding the partial differential equation will not make the cover story of the top mathematics publications. I invented a new system of partial differential equations that was the cover story of the May 1990 issue of the Siam News. The top publication in research mathematics. Abstract calculus and large-scale algebra were at the mathematical physics core of my supercomputer invention. My contribution to modern mathematical knowledge and extreme-scale computational physics is this. I constructed algebraic algorithms that I used to derive a new system of finite difference equations of algebra that approximated at finite places my new partial differential equations of calculus that was defined at infinite places and therefore required infinite calculations to solve its associated initial boundary value problem exactly. What made the news headlines? was that I, Philip M. Arwale, discovered how to crank up my computations and email communications and do so by 16 levels and by 
computing and communicating their answers across a new internet and doing so simultaneously within two raised to power 16 or 64 binary thousand central processing units or within as many computers. Since 1989, I gave lectures in which I explained the details of how I discovered the world's fastest supercomputer. Those lectures were videotaped and posted at emmaagwale.com. Please allow me to present a one-minute version of the new mathematical core of my 200-hour lecture series on my contributions to the development of the computer. In the 1980s, I invented complex email communication primitives, each consisting of a pair of five subject line and three subject line emails. Each email was addressed to 65,536 or two raised to power 16, 16 bit long email addresses. Each email contained a computational fluid dynamics code that each solves an initial boundary value problem of calculus and their initial and boundary conditions. Each email was simultaneously delivered at ferocious speeds and synchronously delivered across some of my 16 times 2 raised to power 16 or 1,048,576 bidirectional email wires. Those email wires had a one edge to one wire correspondence to the as many bidirectional edges of the queue in an imaginary 16 dimensional universe. The end result was that I discovered how 65,536 central processing units can emulate a giant seamless cohesive central processing unit that is 65,536 times more, more powerful than one original CPU. I visualized setting up all 65,536 initial boundary value problems that mathematically define the grand challenge problem and setting them up like ducks in a shooting gallery. My quest was to discover how to topple those ducks over and like a domino. Because I did not invent practical parallel processing in prose, some knowledge of that technology is lost as I translated my new knowledge into a scientific report that is further reduced to, is to a school inventor report of the 12-year-old. In retrospect, the laws of motion of physics were discovered three centuries and three decades ago. The technique of calculus was also invented three centuries and three decades ago. The partial differential equation of calculus was invented a century and a half ago. The partial differential equation is the recurring decimal in computational physics, such as extreme scale, high fidelity petroleum reservoir simulation that is used to extract crude oil and natural gas, and such as long-term general circulation modeling that is used to predict global warming. The super fast supercomputer is used to solve the world's grand challenge problems, such as foreseen otherwise unforeseeable climate changes. The high performance supercomputer is used to increase the pace of scientific discovery and technological invention. The massively parallel supercomputer is used to increase economic growth and to create new mathematics. My contribution to super fast mathematical computations is the reason my name, Philip M. Aguale, and my photo appears in the mathematics textbooks of some 12-year-olds. 
Students that learn about the parallel supercomputer are more likely to choose a career in computer science. My contribution to super fast mathematical computations was the reason my photograph and the description of my new partial differential equations graced the cover of the May 1990 issue of the top publication in the world of mathematics, namely the mathematician's newspaper called Siam News. The supercomputers of the past sequentially process the floating point arithmetical operations that must be executed to solve grand challenge problems arising in STEM fields. In contrast, the supercomputers of today parallel processes the toughest problems by solving a million problems at once. Harnessing an ensemble of one million electronic processors and using it to simultaneously and cooperatively solve a grand challenge problem is mathematically similar to also using an ensemble of one million human computers and using it to tackle the same grand challenge problem. Parallel processing was science fiction when it was first theorized back on February 1, 1922. Simultaneously solving 64,000 initial boundary value problems of mathematical physics was theorized in the book titled Weather Prediction by Numerical Process. The science fiction and parallel process solution of that grand challenge problem of 1922 was defined as 64,000 human computers parallel processing the weather for the whole globe. That was the science fiction precursor to the general circulation parallel processed modeling of today that is used to foresee otherwise unforeseeable global warming. My parallel supercomputer quest that began on June 20, 1974 in Cobalis, Oregon, United States, and ended on the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States, was to make that science fiction of 1922 a reality. I was in the news headlines when I made that parallel supercomputing discovery and did so by did so 67 years later. The big jump in the speed of the supercomputer of today came from my discovery of parallel supercomputing that occurred on the 4th of July 1989. Parallel supercomputing or doing many things at once is the vital technology that underpins the world's fastest computers. To invent the parallel supercomputer was like gazing across the centuries, gazing across the millennia, and searching for our post-human descendants of a million. I once dreamt that in 65,000 years, a super intelligent five-year-old will be parallel will be a parallel processed cyborg, a half-human, a half-machine. But yet, that post-human cyborg had no sense of the history of who invented his or her parallel processed self. If the history of science repeats itself, the names of today's inventors will be lost in the midst of time. The quest for how to massively parallel process across an ensemble of one million processors was in the realm of science fiction for seven decades. Parallel supercomputing was the unorthodox and staggering supercomputer theory that changed the way we look at the modern computer. Before practical parallel supercomputing was discovered, we looked at the core essence of the supercomputer as an isolated processor that is not a member 
of an ensemble of processors. But as perhaps a main node on a new internet that is a planetary super sized supercomputer, hopefully. After I discovered practical parallel supercomputing, I looked at the fastest supercomputer of tomorrow to be a global network of processors and to be a new internet that will be a planetary sized supercomputer, hopefully, that encircled the earth. I was in the news in 1989 because the parallel supercomputer that I discovered was a game changer that changed the game of supercomputing. The bird sings the same song as its ma and pa. Human progress occurs when we sing a better song than our ma and pa. I'm Philip Emma Aguale. I fully described my contributions to the development of the modern supercomputer that is the world's fastest computer. And I've described my contributions at emmaagwale.com. I, an African inventor, invented practical parallel supercomputing that is used to solve real world problems. And that is the technology that underpins everyday supercomputer. The Philip M. Aguale computer is a human invention that is my contribution to human knowledge, but that is not an African invention per se. I'm Philip M. Aguale. My contributions to mathematics is this. I discovered how to solve grand challenge problems known as the most computation intensive problems arising in calculus and algebra. The parallel supercomputing solution of these grand challenge problems has large impact on humanity. I was 34 years old on the 4th of July, 1989, when I discovered how to execute 47,303 floating point arithmetical operations per second per CPU that was not a member of an ensemble of 65,536 processors. I was in the news headlines as the African supercomputer genius that won top US prize and won it for discovering how to harness the world's lowest processors and use them to execute the world's fastest supercomputer calculations and also execute them while solving the toughest real world initial boundary value problems arising in computational physics, abstract calculus, and extreme scale algebra. I totaled those calculations across my new internet. That was my new global network of 65,536 processors. I totaled those calculations on the 4th of July, 1989, and did so to discover the world's fastest computation of 3.1 billion calculations per second. That ultra-fast calculation that I executed across that new internet made the news headlines because I unveiled the new parallel process solution to the grand challenge problems arising in STEM fields. To experimentally discover parallel supercomputing requires a mathematical maturity that includes knowing the partial differential equation and knowing it both forward and backward. The reason is that the partial differential equation, or rather, its finite difference or algebraic approximation is the most recurring decimal inside the parallel supercomputer. Like the physical maturity needed to win a marathon race, the mathematical maturity needed to parallel process across a new internet must grow with experience. It took me 15 years 
on word of June 20, 1974, of full-time study and research to master how to solve a system of partial differential equations and to deeply understand how to formulate it from first principles and on the blackboard and how to solve that system across motherboards and how to use my new parallel supercomputing knowledge to discover and recover otherwise elusive crude oil and natural gas that we are buried millions of years ago and buried one mile deep in an oil field that is the size of a town, such as those in the Niger Delta region of Nigeria, that is my country of birth. In 1989, I was in the news, I was in the news because I experimentally discovered how to parallel process across a new internet that's a new global network of 65,536 tightly coupled central processing units that shared nothing between each other. As a 10 year old walking to school along Bonoba Road, Bonoba Street, Abo, Nigeria, I could not explain why I had to learn the quadratic equation, nor did I understand how the quadratic equation will help solve the economic problems of Nigeria. To us students at St. John's Primary School, Abo, Nigeria, solving the quadratic equation was merely mental gymnastics that had no real life application. To us students, it seemed like the quadratic equation was invented to mentally torture us. Fast forward 25 years, from 1964, from Abo, Nigeria, to Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States, I became the subject of school inventor reports in the US. And was so because my experimental discovery of practical parallel supercomputing was the new knowledge that was not in computer science textbooks that led to the development of new supercomputers that can be up to one billion times faster than old supercomputers. I am studied in American schools for my contribution to the development of the computer. I am the subject of school reports on inventors in part because the quadratic equation of algebra increased my mathematical maturity. That maturity was a prerequisite to solving the once impossible to solve partial differential equations and to parallel supercomputing the solution of the companion large scale algebraic equations that must be solved prior to discovering and recovering otherwise elusive crude oil and natural gas. Back in the early 1980s, I was a supercomputing rebel who was programming massively parallel supercomputers and doing so in the unorthodox and counterintuitive message passing way. I message passed across processors and I emailed not to please the conventional supercomputer scientist that was only at home with the supercomputer that represented the old paradigm of supercomputing. My quintessential question that I pose to the millions of YX students that take a mathematics tests that were conducted by the West African Examination Council in the Gambia, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Nigeria, and that I also pose to the millions of JAM students in Nigeria that take mathematics tests that was conducted by the Joint Admissions and Matriculation Board is this. What is the importance of abstract mathematics? My answer to that quintessential question is this. Mathematics is the bedrock of the Nigerian economy.
I studied mathematics in the United States and did so full time for the 16 years onward of March 25, 1974. I studied mathematics from the storyboard to the blackboard to the motherboard and studied it across boards because my general circulation modeling for foreseeing otherwise unforeseeable global warming demanded that I codify the laws of physics into the partial differential equations of calculus and into a system of equations of algebra. The laws of physics that I codified into mathematical equations included the second law of motion, the law of conservation of mass, the law of conservation of certain chemical species, the first law of thermodynamics, the equation of state, and the radiative transfer equations. As a research computational mathematician that embarked on his solitary quest for the fastest supercomputer that is also a new internet, my focus was on how to parallel process and solve those grand challenge problems that are the toughest problems arising in high performance computational mathematical, mathematical physics. Back in the 1970s, my search for the parallel process solutions of initial boundary value problems of mathematical physics was mocked and trashed as an unrealistic fishing expedition. Parallel supercomputing was the formidable foe in the seven decade long battle to solve the most computation intensive problems arising in STEM fields. The parallel supercomputer is a rethinking of the way the conventional supercomputer solves a grand challenge problem. Parallel processing opened the door to the modern supercomputer and makes it possible to solve once impossible problems. After my discovery of parallel processing, based the new set lines on what of July 4, 1989, every supercomputer manufacturer started integrating parallel processing into its new supercomputers. Parallel processing is the crown jewel of the supercomputer. When I announced my discovery of practical parallel processing, and when I did so on the 4th of July 1989, it wasn't heralded as a breakthrough in supercomputing. At first, my discovery was mocked, dismissed, and rejected as a terrible mistake. The reason my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing was rejected was that I didn't look like Albert Einstein. I was born and raised in the heart of Sub-Saharan Africa instead of born and raised in Europe. Back then, some were offended that I became a famous supercomputer scientist and that I was described in newspaper profiles as the most intelligent man in the world. I was called a quote-unquote black genius because my contributions to knowledge occurred at the intersection of the frontiers of knowledge in the fields of mathematics, physics, and computer science. The year 1989 was a period the term black genius was almost traumatizing for sympathizers sympathizers of white nationalist groups that endlessly denigrated my contributions to the development of the supercomputer. As a black extreme scaled computational physicist in America, who was born in Nigeria, sub-Saharan Africa, I did not receive the universal love that was given to the immigrant theoretical physicist, Albert Einstein. Within closed doors of the supercomputing community, I became a divining rod for this score. Some liked 
me some dumped. I was a lion in the sand. Back in 1989, instead of celebrating my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing, some became obsessed with assassinating my character. They tried to destroy my inner core. They tried to prove me wrong. They questioned my intellect. Yet my work on parallel supercomputing was way over the heads of critics writing negative things about mathematical techniques and supercomputer technolo technologies that lack the intellectual maturity to understand. Because parallel supercomputing was over the, over the heads of the 25,000 vector supercomputer scientists of the 1980s, I was the only full-time programmer of the most massively parallel supercomputers of the 1980s. After 1989, I was attacked, not because parallel supercomputing was not used to solve grand challenge problems, but because my critics were jealous that a, sub that a black sub-Saharan African was ranked with the likes of Albert Einstein. Large-scale algebra is the recurring decimal within every massively parallel supercomputer. My father, Nameka James M. Agwale, began teaching me how to solve the quadratic equation of algebra. I learned the quadratic equation in mid-1964 and at age nine, and from the algebra textbook that was written by an English schoolmaster named Clement Vavasso, C.V. Durrell. I learned the quadratic equation in our house along Bonobar Street, above Nigeria. Fast forward a decade from Bonobar Street, above Midwest region, Nigeria, to 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Cobalis, Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest region of the United States, and to June 20, 1974, I was a 19-year-old that was programming a conventional supercomputer. Back in December 1965, when I was still in Abwa, Nigeria, that supercomputer in Cobalis, Oregon, was rated as the world's fastest supercomputer. It was called the first supercomputer because it was the first supercomputer that could execute one million instructions per second. I programmed that supercomputer from teletype machines and in basic and Fortran languages. Fortran was a general purpose high level, that is natural and third generation computer language. Fortran is the acronym for formula translation. Basically, is the acronym for Beginner's All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code. BASIC was a child of Fortran and was invented in 1946. In my Fortran programs, my large-scale algebraic equations arose from my finite difference approximations of the new partial differential equations of calculus that I invented as a supercomputer programming tool, Fortran enabled me to write my finite difference algebraic equations in English shorthand. Back in 1974, I was supercomputing from a teletype machine and punch tapes, and doing so from Monmouth, Oregon, United States. In 1975, I was supercomputing with a deck of Fortran cards in Corvallis, Oregon. In 1979, I was supercomputing from JCL punch cards and supercomputing in the Foggy Bottom neighborhood of Washington, D.C. The term JCL is the acronym for Job Control Language. JCL is a scripting language 
that I used in the late 1970s, I used to instruct and run a batch job or supercomputer jobs that automatically execute without my interaction. I used JCL to submit my supercomputer programs for execution in batch mode. I wrote my large scale computational fluid dynamics codes of the 1970s and 80s in Fortran, a language that was invented two decades earlier and back in 1957. Supercomputing in that formula translator language meant that I did not have to laboriously encode in machine language or first generation language that was used a decade and a half earlier. I compiled Fortran into an executable language. In 1974 and earlier, many supercomputer programmers were trained as a mathematician. In 1974, I thought of myself as a pure mathematician who loves to program supercomputers. So it was not a coincidence that the supercomputer that was rated at 1 million instructions per second that I began programming on June 20, 1974 was 190 feet from the building that housed all the research mathematicians in Corvallis, Oregon. My contributions to extreme scale algebra is the reason I see myself in algebra textbooks that are published in the United States and Brazil, rather than in algebra textbooks used in my country of birth, Nigeria. In Africa, white scientists became role models for black students, but rarely vice versa in Europe and North America. In the United States, I am taught as a black scientific role model to white children, but in my country of birth, Nigeria, only dead white male scientific role models are taught to black children. As a result of these centuries-old and well-orchestrated misrepresentations of how a genius should look, these African children grow up as adults and are shocked when they attend my scientific lectures and are surprised by the reality that the name Philip Emagwale is cross-listed and on the same page with names like Galileo Galilei, Isaac Newton, and Albert Einstein. People that compare my lectures posted on YouTube to those of Albert Einstein are shocked to learn that I know more about mathematical and computational physics than Albert Einstein did. Research scientists are shocked by the extent of my scientific knowledge and that I have a deep understanding and a masterly command of materials. The black historical figures that are studied in secondary schools in Africa were the great kings of the West African Mali Empire that was founded in 1235 and dissolved in 1400 and the Songhai Empire that was founded in 1430 and dissolved in 1591. Other African historical figures that are studied in schools across Africa include the early 14th century king Mansa Musa and the mid 19th century Hausa warrior queen Amina of Zaria and the late 18th century South African warrior King Shaka Zulu. The late 20th century African history shifted from exploits in battlefields to the fight against apartheid in South Africa that was led by Nelson Mandela. I believe that by the 20, mid 21st century, African history will shift towards contributions made by Africans in the continent and in the diaspora and made to human progress. The most important contributions that Africans can make 
include discoveries and inventions that will expand the body of human knowledge and that will make planet Earth a better place for all beings. I am the subject of school inventor reports because I contributed to the development of the massively parallel supercomputer. The parallel supercomputer demanded more from its inventors. I had to have an intimate understanding of the locations of every processor that outlined and defined my ensemble of 64 binary thousand processors. I had to have a deep understanding in 16-dimensional hyperspace of how to message pass my two raised to power 16 initial boundary value problems of mathematical physics and how to email the associated codes across my 16 times 2 raised to power 16 or 1 million 48,576 bidirectional email pathways and how to route my 64 binary thousand emails to my 16 bit long email addresses. Each email address had no at sign or dot com suffix. In June 1974, I was programming a conventional supercomputer and using the machinery to sequentially solve a system of linear equations of algebra. Fast forward 15 years to the 4th of July, 1989. I became the first person to figure out how to harness a new internet that is a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors and how to use those processors to cooperatively and simultaneously solve a grand challenge problem that is otherwise impossible to solve. An invention only occurs when its inventor crossed a boundary of human knowledge and that had never been crossed before. For me, Philip Emma Aguale, I crossed into the never before understood frontier of knowledge of the parallel supercomputer that is the world's fastest computer. I was the first person to cross that frontier and I crossed it at 8.15 in the morning on July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States. Shortly after my parallel supercomputing discovery, the news headlines became African supercomputer genius wins top US prize. Without parallel processing, the supercomputer of today will not exist. I was in the news headlines because I discovered how to solve the toughest problems arising in STEM fields. I discovered how to solve real world problems and how to solve them across a new internet that is de facto one seamless cohesive machinery that is a virtual supercomputer. My quest for the fastest supercomputer that will compute across a new internet that is a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors began on June 20, 1974 and began as a science fiction and as a theory or an idea that is not positively true. My supercomputer quest began in a singular central processing unit that was my metaphor for the computer and that was a mere acorn or the seed of an oak tree. By the summer of 1974 and at age 19, I was only mentioned twice in newspapers. First, in a newspaper in Nigeria and then in the United States. The name Philip, the name of a 17 year old Philip Emma Aguale, first appeared in 1972 in the science column of the Daily Times of Nigeria. The photograph 
of a 19-year-old Philip Emaiwale appeared on the cover of a local newspaper that circulated in the cities of Bournemouth and Independence, Oregon, United States. That Oregonian newspaper article was published within six days after my interview that occurred on August 9, 1974. Taking a retrospective look, my quest for the fastest supercomputer began on only one central processing unit that was by metaphor for an acorn or the seed of an oak tree in the United States. My acorn blossomed into a mighty oak tree that was my metaphor for a never-before-seen internet that de facto a supercomputer. That new internet was a new global network of 64 binary thousand tightly coupled and identical central processing units. Each processor operated its own operating system and shared nothing with its nearest, 16 nearest neighboring processors. Looking back to the mid-1970s in Oregon, United States, I was coming of age and growing in my awareness that abstract equations, whether algebraic or differential, must be used to discover and recover otherwise elusive crude oil and natural gas and recover them from the mild deep oil fields of the southeastern region of Nigeria. Mathematics is the invincible and abstract weapon that is used to fight poverty in Africa. My quest for the fastest supercomputer took me from the first supercomputer that could execute 1 million instructions per second that was at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Covalis, Oregon, United States, to an ensemble of 64 binary thousand commodity of the shelf processors that was in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States. In the 1970s and 80s, I was a researcher in search for the massively parallel supercomputer that I hoped would become the world's fastest computer. In theory, the grand challenge question was this. How can we execute infinite calculations and do so across a large but finite number of processors or across an internet and complete it in finite time? The answer is that it will always be impossible to execute infinite calculations. But in 1989, I was in the news headlines because I discovered the practical answer to that grand challenge question. Namely, I figured out how to we could reduce 108 years or 65,536 days of time to solution across a new internet that is a new global network of 65,000. 536 processors that is not a supercomputer per se, but that is a new internet de facto. An important problem that takes 108 years of time to solution is classified by the US government as a grand challenge problem. That grand challenge problem is solvable in 108 years, but is unsolvable in one day. In 1989, I was in the news headlines because I discovered how to reduce that time to solution from 108 years on one computer to just one day across a new internet that is a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors. The reason I was able to solve the once impossible to solve problem was that I asked basic questions about how never before seen supercomputers could compute extraordinarily fast and apply that speed to solve the toughest problems arising in STEM fields. I discovered that the modern supercomputer must parallel process across millions upon millions of processors and must 
do so to solve as many initial boundary value problems of mathematical physics. In retrospect, it's incredible that parallel supercomputing, the vital technology that was mocked, ridiculed, and dismissed as a huge waste of everybody's time, is now benefiting everybody. Parallel processing or solving many problems at once is the irreducible essence of the modern supercomputer. In the 1970s, the parallel supercomputer was mocked and ridiculed and dismissed as useless and clumsy. That was the reason I conducted my research, my parallel supercomputer research alone. I programmed supercomputers alone because it was believed that it will forever remain impossible to harness an ensemble of eight or more processors. I used eight to achieve a speed increase of a factor of eight or more and achieve that speed increase when solving the toughest problems arising in mathematical physics. Parallel processing was dismissed as the end of the road in the never ending quest for the faster supercomputer. After my discovery that occurred on the 4th of July 1989 and that made the news headlines, the modern supercomputer that is the world's fastest had to parallel process across millions upon millions of processors that shared nothing. What kept me moving forward and alone during my parallel processing research that I did in the United States and did in the 1970s and 80s was my visceral feeling that the computer is older than myself and that the supercomputer is larger than myself. On the 4th of July, 1989, I discovered how parallel processing makes the supercomputer super. Parallel processing is vital to the computer and supercomputer. My contribution to the development of the supercomputer is this, I figured out how to harness the fastest massively parallel supercomputer ever. That discovery of parallel processing is used every day in every supercomputer. Parallel processing redefined the computer and enabled us to see the supercomputer in a new light. In the 1980s, I was perhaps the world's leading consumer of algebraic equations. I was solving a world record system of 24 million equations of algebra and solving that system at the then on hand of supercomputer speed of 24 million equations that I solved during each second and with seven circles completed during each second. Doing so enabled me to record the world's fastest computation as of the 4th of July, 1989. I was in the news because I discovered the fastest computer speeds and did so on a virtual supercomputer that was not a computer per se. I discovered the fastest computer speeds across a new internet that's a new global network of 65,536 central processing units with each processor operating its own operating system and sharing nothing. In 1989, it made the news headlines that a Nigerian supercomputer genius in the United States had experimentally discovered how a new internet, that is a new global network of 65,536 CPUs could be harnessed and used to synchronously solve a system of 24 million algebraic equations that arose in extreme scale computational physics and do so per email circle and iterate seven email circles per second. I did so across that new internet 
to record the world's fastest supercomputer calculation. I, Philip M. Aguale, was that Nigerian supercomputer scientist that was in the news back in 1989. My discovery of the parallel supercomputer was also highlighted in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal. My contribution to the development of the supercomputer is this. In the 1980s, when the parallel supercomputer was mocked, ridiculed, and dismissed as a huge waste of everybody's time, I discovered that that grand challenge problems arising in computational physics that are impossible to solve on a conventional supercomputer is possible to solve across the millions upon millions of commodity of the shelf processors that outline and define the parallel supercomputer. My discovery of parallel processing became newsworthy because I experimentally proved that I can perform the then world record 3.1 billion calculations per second and execute them across a new internet that is a new global network of 65,536 central processing units. Each processor performed only 47,330 calculations per second. I achieved seven cycles of 65,536 simultaneous emails per second. In 1989, I parallel processed around the clock or 24 seven. In that year, I had two mental images of my virtual supercomputer that was not a computer per se. I'm not bound by a contract to describe the parallel supercomputer that I invented in 1989 and describe that new supercomputer for the understanding of the conventional supercomputer scientists of the late 1940s. Nor do I have to describe that new supercomputer in the exact sense that I understood it when I conceived it in the 1970s. I described my inventions in the light of newer understandings. The word computer was first used in print 2,000 years ago and first used by the Roman author Pliny the Elder. The word computer meant different things to Jesus Christ and to Philip Emmanuel. My first modern supercomputer was a parallel processing machinery that was a new global network of 65,536 central processing units or a new internet. I discovered how to use that first supercomputer to perform the world's fastest calculations and do so while solving the toughest problems arising in STEM fields. My second supercomputer is the sister parallel processing machinery that was first published as the science fiction story of 64,000 human computers and published back on February 1, 1922 and in the book Weather Prediction by the Miracle Process. My contribution to the development of the supercomputer is this. I theorized that science fiction as my reality that was comprised of my new global network of 65,536 or 64 binary thousand tightly coupled commodity processors that tightly encircled a globe in the way the internet does. The black inventor must fight hard to get credit for his invention. I am no exception. In the 1980s, I invented a new supercomputer that was new because it was defined by a never before seen processor to processor configuration. That new supercomputer was also a new internet de facto. The greatest contribution of the black inventor and the reason he or she is the subject of school reports is that his or her contributions to science 
and technology change the narrative of white intellectual supremacy. I found it troublesome that even though there's only one body of scientific knowledge, America's history of slavery and Jim Crow segregation, the fact of created artificial distinctions between what I, as a black scientist, can contribute to human knowledge and what a white scientist can contribute. In 1989, I discovered how to harness a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors and how to use them to solve the toughest problems arising in STEM fields. I was able to make my discovery of practical parallel processing and do so because I visualized my ensemble of processors as evenly distributed around my globe that I defined in 16-dimensional hyperspace. I visualized each processor as separated by equal distances from 16 nearest neighboring processors. For planet Earth, that has a diameter of 7,917 and a half miles, each of my 65,536 processors would cover an area of about 3,000 square miles. I metaphorically visualized that new supercomputer that I used to experimentally discover practical parallel processing. My metaphor for my new supercomputer was a cube in an imaginary 16 dimensional universe. I visualized supercomputing with 65,536 central processing units that I visualized as evenly distributed at each of the two raised to power 16 or 65,536 vertices of that cube that I visualized in 16 dimensional hyperspace. I visualized my 16 pairs of bidirectional email wires as emanating from each vertex of the cube and in the 16 perpendicular directions that is along the 16 edges that emanated from each vertex. For that specific config configuration, my parallel processing ensemble had 1,048,576 short email wires that I visualized as uniformly distributed on the surface of a globe in a 16-dimensional universe. The parallel supercomputer wizardry that made the news headlines back in 1989 was that I parallel processed across a new internet that was a new global network of 65,536 central processing units. In effect, I parallel processed blindfolded and did so without seeing any of those processors with my naked eyes. It was for a good reason that I parallel processed alone. Back in the 1980s, the reason was that parallel supercomputing was then dismissed as impossible. Please allow me to put the parallel supercomputer in the perspective of the 1970s. Back then, solving a grand challenge problem and solving it by dividing it into one billion smaller problems and solving them while maintaining a one problem to one processor correspondence and doing so with one billion processors was a very terrifying thought. That was the reason no sane supercomputer scientist attempted to solve the grand challenge problem. That sense of foreboding prompted the Computer World magazine to carry a negative article on the future of the parallel supercomputer. That article was published in its June 14, 1976 issue and was titled, quote, Research in Parallel Processing, Question as Waste of Time, unquote. In the 1970s, to parallel process through invincible to raised to power 16 or 65,536 central processing units that encircled a globe in a 16-dimensional hyperspace was like searching for two raised to power 16 black boxes that were equal distances apart 
and on the surface of a globe that was in a dark 16-dimensional universe. I had to visualize the exact locations of each of, of each and every central processing unit that I must parallel process across before I could harness that processor to solve a computation-intensive grand challenge problem. As the first and the only full-time parallel processing supercomputer scientist of the 1980s, I had no competitor when it came to giving lectures on how to solve a million problems at once or in parallel. In the 1980s, a pattern of invitation that was followed by disinvitation emerged. In the United States, I will be invited to give a seminar lecture on a parallel supercomputer and invited by telephone. When the seminar organizers discover that I am black and African, they will find a pretext to disinvite me from delivering my lecture on the massively parallel supercomputer even though I was the only person in the world that could teach them how to solve a grand challenge problem and do so by chopping it up into one million smaller problems and solving them with a one problem to one processor correspondent mapping. After several disinvitations, I learned to disguise my identity as a black African and pass as a white person in the field of supercomputing. For that reason, many supercomputer scientists of the 1980s thought that I was from Eastern Europe and presumed that I was white and were shocked when they met me on February 28, 1990 in San Francisco, California, the date and place I was awarded the top prize in the field of supercomputing. The IEEE committee that gave me the top prize for my contributions to practical parallel supercomputing would have revoked that prize if they had discovered before the award ceremony that I was black and African. Everybody was shocked when I stood up to receive that supercomputer prize. That prize is won by a team of up to 50 supercomputer scientists. I am the supercomputer scientist to win that prize alone. Thank you. Insightful and brilliant lecture. Insightful and brilliant lecture.